Our next speaker is Michael I. Jordan. Michael I. Jordan is the Pei Hong Chen Distinguished Professor in the EECS Department and the Department of Statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. His research interests include machine learning, optimization, control theory, and computational biology. Professor Jordan is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a foreign member of the Royal Society. He was a plenary lecturer at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 2018. He has received the Earth Grolander Prize from the American Mathematical Society, the IEEE John von Neumann Medal, the IJCAI Research Excellence Award, and the ACM AAAI Alan Newell Award. Michael, thank you for joining us. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Michael Jordan from the University of California, Berkeley. I'm going to be talking today about uh, AI and machine learning in the context of microeconomics thinking. All right, so why should I be interested in microeconomics uh, meets machine learning? Um, well, machine learning is uh, it's a broad field, but it has two main sides to it. One is the pattern recognition side, um, and the other is the decision-making side. Pattern recognition has been the focus of a lot of work, um, a lot of the software platforms, um, and um, a lot of the business models in the past few years. It's become a commodity via systems such as TensorFlow and PyTorch, um, but it's also important to recognize the limitations of pattern recognition. Uh, so that's an older terminology from the 60s and 70s, but already then there was gradient descent algorithms uh, on data sets. Um, and what's happened in the intervening 30 years is really just things have gotten bigger and faster. Pattern recognition takes in data sets, ideally with labels um, and mixed predictions. Um, so you might sort of think, given all the success of machine learning, that making really good predictions is all there is to machine learning um, and AI. And uh, I'm going to argue that that would be wrong, that decision making is equally, if not more important for real world decision making, especially in the context of other decision makers, when we start to talk about things like market mechanisms. So when I take about, talk about markets here, it's going to be as an academic thinking about the algorithmic consequences of, of markets. How do you build markets using data and using algorithms? Um, there's many open problems here, and this ties directly to business models in, in a number of companies. Uh, so just to remind you, pattern recognition has become essentially deep learning. We have layered systems with parameters, and we adjust the parameters based on a gradient descent algorithm. Um, you ne typically need label data, or you can use self-labeling. Um, there's obviously a uh, great interest in this and great progress. Uh, it's not so clear about the productivity gains yet. Um, being able to do things like computer vision and um, um, and robotics problems have definitely helped, but um, it's not as clear, for example, as with search engines or with recommendation systems in the previous generation. Um, so let's talk, though, about decision-making. I think this is one of the reasons we've not seen the productivity gains yet. People are not really ready to deploy these systems in the real world. Um, so think about, uh, as a thought experiment, going into a doctor's office in you know two or three years, and imagine the doctor possesses a big deep learning system that has been trained on all the world's medical knowledge. Uh, you know, suppose all the hospitals have agreed to supply data and, and individuals have uh, signed NDAs or, um, and the, the, you know, the data has been all gathered and, and a big system has been trained. Um, and so what does the system do? Well, it makes predictions about your health. So you, you, you put in as input a, say, 100,000 dimensional feature vector describing your current state of health, your blood pressure, your height, your weight, but also your genome and maybe local measurements of your uh, within your body, and that goes into this big neural network and it makes predictions. So it might predict, for example, one of the outputs could be whether you're uh, likely to have a heart attack in the next uh, few weeks or not. And suppose that based on the historical data, um, a, a number bigger than 0.7 means you're about ready to have a heart attack. And suppose that your number is 0.701. Um, so in what sense did you really treat this as a decision that you should act on it and have surgery? And the answer is definitely not. You're, you're, you're first of all going to ask things about uh, the error 
um, you know, maybe my number was 0 0.701 and the threshold is 0.7. How sure are we are of my number? Um, you know, was was the network trained on data for people like me or was it trained on uh, different people? Was it trained recently or five years ago? Um, was the machine used to gather the data the same as the machine for me? And so on and so forth. Um, these are what contribute to uncertainty and current machine learning uh, based on the pattern recognition paradigm is pretty poor at uncertainty quantification of this of this kind of rich kind. Doctors are pretty good at it. You can start asking these questions and they'll start to tell you and you'll feel more uncertainty seeping into the reasoning process. But what doctors can do a lot more than that. They can also run what if experiments and reason in the current context. So uh, if you've had that result, that prediction, you might say, oh my goodness, I just remembered I used to have asthma as a child or or my parents had heart disease. I didn't remember that and I didn't tell anybody about that. But you know, now that it's relevant, I remember it. You'll remember all kinds of relevant things um, that you didn't put into the big neural network. And, and you realize now that the idea of putting all the world's medical knowledge into a pattern recognition system is really not very meaningful because any decision will bring new relevance uh, new relevant information to the fore that you didn't ever think of, of before. That's contingent decision making and it's very much the kind of real world decision making that humans do. Um, they also engage in counterfactuals. You know, what if I were to exercise more? What if I were to eat better and so on? And a good doctor would then have a dialogue about that and they might even do some further data analysis. They might add that counterfactual to the previous data set and see how the prediction changes. Um, and this is what, you know, reasoning, you know, it's medical reasoning and, and um, what you should do with a good doctor. Um, and that's what's going to eventually lead to your decision to, you know, either wait or get a second opinion or whatever. Um, so real world decision making is, is just almost always of this kind. It's rarely just make a prediction and, uh, and execute uh, a threshold. Um, as, and, and the problem is a lot of machine learning was developed in domains like, is there a bunny in the image? Um, where it's not consequential, there's no life or death decision, but real world decision making is often, uh, you know, very important and consequential. And now we're not ever just making one decision in our lives, we're often making interlaced decisions. On any given day, there's lots of decisions in the moment, there's decisions about where you're going to have dinner, there's decisions about your career, they're all kind of uh, interacting. And they're interacting with other people as well. Their decisions are, are influencing your decisions. And there's conflict, there might be collusion, there might be uh, cooperation, and it gets interesting and complex in the way that um, economists are familiar uh, um, in talking about. So economists think about people as being linked in networks, and a good decision had to do with what everybody else's decisions are. So there might be scarcity, you might have, not, not everybody can get the same service. You can't have everybody go down the same street and so on and so forth. Um, so machine learning hasn't really faced this kind of way of thinking very much. Um, a recommendation system just makes a recommendation. It doesn't think about the consequences. And in fact, if you start to use recommendations as a kind of thought experiment domain, it's very helpful. Um, you know, recommendations of our pattern recognition systems, they take in past data and they make essentially predictions about what people are likely to buy. Um, you know, and it's a big success for massive productivity gains from recommendation systems. Um, and so they've been used as a commodity in all kinds of business models and uh, problems start to arise. So if you think about, you know, recommending movies, um, you know, if you start having, um, you know, millions of people on your platform and you're recommending movies, it's quite likely you'll recommend the same movie to 100,000 people in any given day. Um, and that's not a problem because you can copy the bits as much as you want and stream it to everybody. And same with books. You can uh, copy books on demand nowadays and, and get them to people within a day. Uh, but as soon as you start using recommendation systems for real world goods, so for example, suppose you're recommending restaurants to people in a particular city in a particular hour of the day. Um, it, it might be that you, know, you recommend the same restaurant to a thousand people and you've now created a line down the street. And this has happened in the real world with people building recommendation systems. Um, and people don't really know what to do about this, the, the developers of the platform. They, they will often think about it as a load balancing problem. I got to, oh, I can't send a thousand people there. I can only send 10. So as soon as I hit 10, I cut off. Um, but which 10? And not just the first 10, that shouldn't, that's not a very good uh, mechanism. Maybe they don't really want to go to that restaurant. They'd be just as happy at some other restaurant. And you start to realize this is what markets are all about, is trying to decide how to match um, which people go to which colleges. Well, it depends on everybody else who's applying. It depends on the colleges as well. And so really, we have something more like a two-sided two market. 
Same thing arises in domains like, um, you know, um, trying to tell recommend streets to drivers. What's the fastest route to the airport? Well, if no one else is on the street, there's no scarcity. You can send, you know, the uh, people on your platform down the fastest route. As soon as everyone's using your platform, when you do that, you create congestion. And um, so again, how do you fix this? It's, it, it's, it's not just a load balancing problem. You can't just say, well, I'm gonna send only 10 people down that street. Because again, which 10? And it really should depend on things like who's in the biggest hurry or who might be happy to go on some other route. Um, there should be something more like an auction process in a very lightweight sense, but there should be bids being made. All right, so I think the way to think about a lot of these systems is, um, is, is involving the creation of markets. Um, so we have producers and consumers. Um, so it's classical microeconomics. You're trying to link and match producers and consumers, but classical microeconomics didn't use data to make those matches. They used a, a known preferences that people would list which colleges they wanted to go to the most. The colleges would list the kind of people they wanted. And, um, and once all those lists were made, then a matching process occurred and it was shown to you know, provide economic value. Um, the, the new world is where all this is done based on data. And, and this isn't entirely mysterious. Something like Uber, you know, did, has built something like this. Drivers and riders are consumers and producers. Um, and, uh, you know, but I think because it's in the transportation domain, a lot of people didn't realize the kind of the, the, the generality of this and the fact that the data is being used internally. Um, I don't think people realized it. So if you start to think about other domains, for example, music, this starts to become quite apparent that there's something that can be done and it's part of AI and machine learning to do it. Um, so, uh, you know, music is, a, is really a broken market. A lot of people are making music more than, um, by, by far more than ever before in history. And of course, more people are listening to music than ever before in history. So you'd think it's a really wonderful working market and it's exactly the opposite. A few people are making billions of dollars and uh, most of the young 16 to 18 year olds who are actually making the music that people are really listening to, if you look at the data, they're not making hardly any money at all or no money essentially. Um, so the problem is that the platform, maybe Spotify or whatever, is simply taking in the bits and streaming them to people and not trying to think of themselves as building a market between the producers and the consumers. They, they make money on uh, you know, subscriptions or advertising or something. Um, so instead, why don't you have a system that's a two-way market where musicians can have a dashboard and they can see where their songs are being listened to. They can see where they're popular, what city. Uh, they can then propose to venue owners to go to those cities. They can tell the venue owners who the people listening to them are and, and advertise to them directly. Um, and you can build up a whole market. Um, so this hadn't been done until recently. There's now a company called United Masters um, I'm actually involved, I'm on the board here, and Steve Stout, whose picture is there in the lower right, is the, the, the uh, CEO uh, who has created this, this entity called UI Masters. There's uh, over 1.5 million musicians now on, this, uh, uh, in, on United Masters uh, who've signed. Um, their music is being streamed to the NBA, and when the NBA plays their songs, uh, the NBA pays and the money goes to the musicians. Um, and so instead of the famous musicians getting rich from royalties, um, the 16 year olds are actually having a salary now based on this two way market that's been created. Behind the scenes is of course a lot of machine learning of trying to find the right matching, trying to analyze the data, trying to make good predictions and then structure that market so that the producers and consumers and the brands are all connected up in a healthy, um, economically sound structure. Um, all right, so if you start to think this way, you realize that AI machine learning has kind of been missing the boat and thinking about putting intelligence in a single computer and then hoping that that would somehow add value, that would somehow allow you to solve real world problems. Um, the, you've, forgot, you've neglected the fact that a lot of intelligence is market kind of intelligence. The market itself is intelligent uh, in different ways than a single human is intelligent. And so any uh, science of, or engineering field that purports to have intelligent behavior should also be using uh, principles of markets and matchings and mechanisms uh, to build social structures that include computers so the overall system is healthy and happy. Um, so think about medical systems where data is being gathered and tested and so on, and think about commerce and think about finance. Uh, these are all emerging systems based on decision-making, human desires and preferences uh, and data and everything is being valued economically. So this is the kind of systems that we're really trying to think about building. 
And when you do this, there's tons of open academic problems. Um, I'm an academic, and so these are the kind of things that I, um, I spend my days working on, relationships among optima, equilibria, and dynamics. Um, optima have been studied in machine learning a great deal. We know how to do gradient descent. Equilibria has more to do with fixed points. It's something that economists tend to study. And the relationships among optima and equilibria are not so clear. They're still emerging. Um, and in particular, when you have dynamical systems that try to go towards equilibria, and when you have systems that never really reach equilibria because the world is complex and large, um, then it gets yet more interesting uh, conceptually, mathematically, and in terms of real-world implementation. Um, also, building multi-way markets in which you have to explore to learn your preferences. Already, my restaurant example has that flavor. I don't know a priori which restaurants I prefer. I need to try them out a little bit to start to, to form preferences. Uh, and then as I form my preferences, the market shall hopefully get more efficient and better matching me to the kind of places I want to go and doing that for everybody so the overall uh, market is adaptive and economically efficient. Recommendation systems, um, and then some of the technical problems involving uncertainty quantification, which are unresolved with neural nets, they become different in this domain because your uncertainty, again, depends on what other people are doing, what the options are, how much scarcity there is, and so on. Uh, and then some of these other things I'm going to talk about in the remainder of my talk a bit, but just let me skip to fairness, privacy, and social good. These are things that many people are talking about now that machine learning is not doing a very good job with. Every one of those really has an economic side to it. Uh, you want to trade off the amount of privacy you lose for something you might gain. Um, if I give up my data, I am expect to get maybe an economic gain for that, or maybe some research is done with my data that benefits someone that I care about um, in my family. Um, you know, similarly in fairness, I don't necessarily uh, want to have perfect fairness, but I want to at least trade off lack of fairness for something else I might gain. Uh, so these are the ways that econo economics people would think about these things, and we need our machine learning systems to do so as well. All right, so in the rest of my talk, I'm going to skip ahead here uh, to just a couple of examples of research problems that we've worked on to kind of give you a flavor of the challenges that you can and should face as you start to think about new kinds of algorithms that are both learning algorithms, you know, gradient descent, but also equilibria, and also involving social uh, you know, consequences kind of built into the design of the system. Uh, so um, I'm not going to get into details here. These are all archive papers, and you know there's theorems and uh, algorithms, and you can peruse those at your leisure. I just want to give you a flavor of the challenge and a little bit of kind of what a solution looks like. Uh, so the first one area is this area called strategic classification. This is work with Tiana Zernich, Eric Mazundar at Berkeley. Um, this arises when you have uh, people providing data, and they have a vested interest in the outcome of the data analysis. So if you ask me to provide data um, in the context of a health insurance application, I want the insurance and I want a cheap rate. So I'm probably, if you ask me about things like how, how much do you exercise, I'm going to lie a little bit. I'm going to shade the data a little bit to get a better rate because I have a model in my mind of how you're evaluating the data. Um, and so people will do this and they do it all the time. And so, you know, companies know this, so they ask hard questions like, um, I'm not going to just ask you how much exercise, I'm going to ask you to give me access to your cell phone for a day, and I'm going to measure on the accelerometer how much movement is going on, and that's a proxy for how much exercise you're getting. Um, but then, of course, people design systems like on the right there, where you put your cell phone in a little device and it moves the cell phone around artificially, and you've now fooled the uh, insurance company. Of course, the insurance company, again, knows this, and so they you know, have to kind of think about how to get good data analysis despite this happening. All right, so in general, there are feedback loops in learning, and this is really a game. It's, we're now in game theory. The agents want a favorable prediction, the decision makers want to minimize their prediction loss, and uh, best responses are going back and forth in the two directions. The um, decision maker responds with a predictive model to data from the agents. The data, the agents look at the model and they say, oh, given that model, I can change my data in a certain way so I get a better prediction, um, a better rate or whatever. Um, so in economics, this is called a Stackelberg game. Um, it's not a Nash game where it's uh, simultaneous. This is sequential. Um, and you can analyze this and ask what the equilibria might be. And it's a particular kind of Stackelberg game, what we might call a statistical Stackelberg game, where one best response by the decision maker is to build a model, and the other is to provide data. All right, so long story short in this context, uh, this has been analyzed a bit. Um, and it's been done in a very synchronized setting where the decision maker and the agents are both synchronously responding to each other, okay? 
Uh, one leads and the other follows, but it's being done at the same time and the same time frames. Um, and there you can study the equilibrium, and, and it's been done, and it turns out the agents are, are not getting a very good deal. The equilibrium that arise here are favorable for the decision maker and not very favorable for the strategic agents. All right, so we said, well, what happens if you decouple the time scales, make it these asynchronous? Because in the real world, these platforms are going to be very asynchronous. And so what, what happens if you study that? And so we've studied two different kinds of decision maker agent relationships. Here, the decision makers are slow and the agents are fast. Uh, so does this ever actually happen in real life? And, you know, of course it does. College admissions is an example. The college doesn't update its policy ever after every person, and they update it only every couple of years. Um, and the other direction where the decision maker is very fast, that's more like YouTube or whatever, after, you know, they have huge compute and they can adjust the models really, really quickly. All right, so you can study this kind of dynamics and, and we have in a series of papers, and just to give you a little bit of a, a take home message here, uh, it turns out that in this class of games, there are equilibria, and in the situation where the agents lead, not the decision maker, but the agents are the leaders, um, then the equilibrium that arises is more favorable for the agents, but also more favorable for the, for the central decision maker. So that's a surprise. Uh, it's, it's in some sense a new theorem in game theory for a particular class of games. Um, okay, let me just mention a couple of other problems to give you, again, more of a flavor of the challenges here. This is on statistical contract theory. Uh, contract theory is, a do is an area of economics that arises when there's a principal and, and a set of agents, and the principal wants to get the agents to do something, um, but the agents know something that the principal doesn't know. Uh, so in the particular, the, the FDA is trying to decide which drugs to approve, and um, the agents are the drug companies who are trying to supply possible candidate drugs. The agents probably know something about how good the drug is, or maybe it's not effective at all, the principal doesn't know that, and they can't just ask. So they have to somehow incentivize some kind of actions on the, on the case of the agents. All right, so this is worked out, you know, there's a field called contract theory. But again, it's not statistical. There's not just, you don't collect data as part of the overall feedback loop here uh, of this. So we've been working now on statistical contract theory. We have contract theory meets name and Pearson testing. Um, this is big deal. Uh, clinical trials in the United States are millions and millions of dollars, and we all know about these from the vaccines. Um, and so this is what the FDA has to do, spend a lot of money to decide whether a drug should go to uh, market or not. If you ask how would you do this, uh, the statistical answer is you do something like Neyman Pearson. You have type 1 errors and type 2 errors or false positive, false negatives. And here for the bad drugs, the probability of approval, we could you know, run a test that makes sure that that's no bigger than 5%. And the probability of the power um, is 80%. Um, and you could ask, is that a good protocol? Um, well, it depends is the answer. It depends on the context, the economic context. Um, so if uh, you, in case one, if it costs you $20 million to run the trial, which is pretty typical, Let's suppose this is a situation where if you're approved, your drug is approved, you can make about $200 million, okay? If you actually do a calculation now of the expected profit, given that the drug is actually not effective, theta is equal to zero, um, given all the setup here, that number turns out to be minus 10 million. And both the FDA and the agents could do that calculation. The agents do it and they realize, um, well, unless I really believe in my drug being good because I've done some internal testing, I better not do this, play this game. And so they back out. And so the only drugs that are sent to the FDA tend to be good drugs. That's good. On the other hand, if uh, on case two, it still costs 20 million to run the trial, but um, if you, your drug is approved, you make 2 billion. So it's a more, you know, it's a more widely used drug. Now, if you do the same calculation, it turns out your expected profit is 80 million. So now the drug companies are incentivized to send whatever possible drug, to, you know, uh, that even looks at remotely good to the FDA. The FDA spends a lot of money and approves, unfortunately, some bad drugs. Um, okay, so uh, we've been working on this, and it turns out there are solutions to this um, involving what we call statistical contract theory. There's a protocol where an agent pays a certain amount, and um, uh, having opted into the game, or they decide not to opt in at all, not pay anything, once they've opted in, they choose a payout function from a menu. And this is something like choosing business class or economy fare in an airplane. You decide how much you want to pay, 
and you do it as a consequence, uh, as a function of how much uh, wealth you have or how much you believe that it's a, be a really nice service to have an extra glass of wine in, or a little bit bigger seat. Uh, so that's what contract theory does, is it structures these contracts. Uh, so we've learned, we've figured out how to design contracts for the statistical uh, testing problem. And again, I'm gonna skip the details, uh, but we've been able to define a notive notion of incentive-aligned tests um, and we've been able to show, I'm going to skip all the details here, let me just go to this next slide, that they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with what are called E-values in statistics. So this relates a statistical quantity, not P-values, that's more name and Pearson, E-values, which are more appropriate for these um, economics problems. Um, all right, so I'm going to try to move towards closure here. Um, I do have one more problem just to briefly allude to. Uh, this is the competing bandits and matching markets problem. We've been working on this, Lydia and Horia at Berkeley. Um, and this is a situation where we have exploration, exploitation trade-offs. So the classical bandit problem is that an agent is trying to decide which of a set of actions is best. So they explore. They maybe try one arm and see what reward they get. They try another arm and see what reward they get. And there are algorithms which do this optimally, decide how much exploration to do and how much exploitation to do to get a good reward, but, but not miss out on the, on the really good arms. All right. Um, now, if you do that in a, I'm going to skip the details of that. If you do that in a market, it's a really new, interesting world. So here's a matching market. Um, you know, Nobel prizes have been given for this. Uh, so suppose that you have a market in which uh, the participants have already written down their preferences. So like in the colleges and students domain, so the buyers uh, have written down their preferences for the sellers, and the sellers have written down their preference for the buyers. And now their algorithms, for example, deferred acceptance, that find good matches, stable matches. The new problem that emerges is if you have now multiple agents, um, as in a market, a matching market, but they're also learning. They are trying to explore and exploit. And so you can ask things like, what if two agents pick the same arm as part of their exploration? Um, well, in a classical machine learning paradigm, you just would give them both a reward. But here, we're going to assume there's scarcity because it's an economic setting. And this is like multiple people going to the same restaurant. We're only going to give one of them the, the reward, the bear in this case. And which one gets the reward? Well, arm two gets to decide because they're forming their own preferences for the other side of the market. And so now the human looks at that and they say, I see if I pick the arm two, I like arm two, it's a good arm but the bear also seems to like it. And when the bear picks it, um, the bear wins. And so I better explore some of the other arms more than I otherwise would. And that latter statement suggests there will be further regret in a learning sense for a, an exploration algorithm. And so uh, based on the competition. So economic competition is gonna lead to higher regret in a learning sense. Um, and again, I'm, there's details I'm not gonna get into, but we have a theory that, that actually analyzes this and tells us how much. Okay, so my last comment before I close is, um, what are the consequences of all this for computer systems? Um, well, um, you know, first of all, it's computer systems can't be just big data analysis systems. They've got to be much more asynchronous, uh, decentralized, and thinking about the market that they are structuring and thinking about how to make that market healthy and transparent and so on. Um, and the, the principles are gonna be different than just a big data analysis stack, all right? So I should say that this way of thinking is already something in our, in our DNA at Berkeley. Um, you know, five to 10 years ago, we were already thinking about this and we were thinking about asynchronous platforms that allow decision makers to make asynchronous decisions and have local state um, and then still do this in the cloud, do this on a very, very large scale um, so something like Hadoop or Spark, but asynchronous. And that's what Ray is. Uh, so with colleagues, uh, Philip Moritz, Nisha, Robert Nishihara, and, another, and many others, including Jan Stoika, we, uh, we developed this platform, Ray, which is now being um, hardened up uh, in the company AnyScale, um, which, is, uh, which is built Ray. And Ray is often described as simply a you know, distributed system, kind of distributed Python. And the original, in fact, a model was, you know, to take all of the different machine learning components, including some economic ones, which I haven't listed here, um, and note that when you try to make distributed versions of these, it's, it's a big engineering effort, and uh, argue that a nice idea would be to build one distributed protocol system that allowed uh, each of these capabilities to be libraries on top of that. And that way of thinking has definitely continued on um, in the Ray project. Um, 
But, you know, behind in under the hood, what's key about Ray is that it's both functional programming and object-oriented programming. Hadoop and Spark, um, you know, were fun essentially m m functional programming systems. They kind of had to be at this very large scale, um, you know, at very decentralized setting. Um, but Ray, uh, you know, bites the bullet and, and brings both functions and, and, and objects into the distributed world. So you could have a model of distributed asynchronous computing. So Ray is effectively distributed asynchronous Python. Um, and um, in a longer talk, I would dig into this a bit more, but uh, this we believe is, is a good first candidate for a platform that allows you to start thinking about uh, economics, microeconomics uh, forms of machine learning. All right, so my last slide, and then I'm gonna close. Um, is this. Um, I think that what machine learning and AI are is not thought being put inside the computer, a la John McCarthy. Maybe in the future it'll be that. Um, and it's not just big, big data analysis. That's very much what's in the air nowadays. It's been very useful and accept and helpful. But it's really about building these huge systems that are planetary scale, that involve economic concepts and data flows that are valued economically, that create jobs like in the music example, um, that create opportunities uh, and are, are, are you know, economic flows based on computer science principles. And I think this is very much like the creation of previous engineering disciplines like chemical engineering from chemistry and quantum physics or electrical engineering from electromagnetism. Uh, we have some proto principles now involving computing and algorithms and data analysis. And what we're really groping towards is how to build big systems that really work and give value to people are fair or useful or transparent and so on. Um, so that's the end of my talk and I re appreciate having an audience for it. Thank you.